Hi, I'm David Abrams, and I want to welcome you to this edition of the Tenant Experience Network podcast. I want to welcome today's guest, Neil LaSure, Executive Vice President of Real Estate Management at Avis & Young, one of the world's fastest growing commercial real estate firms operating in 15 countries with 400 million square feet under management. In this episode, we will learn about Neil's journey to his current position at Avis & Young, where he combines his learning from being an entrepreneur with his corporate experience. We will tap into his thinking around building your own story as one of his keys to success and get a glimpse into what is top of mind for Neil as he continues to navigate through new challenges and emerging opportunities. We're excited to be sharing this podcast with you, so make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode of the Tenant Experience Network. And now I'd like to welcome Neil to the show. Hey, Neil, glad you could be with us today. Hey, David. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's jump right in. Let's start with your journey to your current position at Avis & Young. How did you get started? Walk me through that process. Uh, yeah, it's been, an, it's been a long journey. Uh, I, I can't believe I can say that, but that's kind of the stage that I'm at now. Um, lots of experiences, right? So I uh, went to school on the West Coast at the University of Victoria, took an economics degree, um, just because I was sort of interested in business and that was kind of where I was going, but I didn't have a plan. And I finished up my degree and uh, moved to Vancouver and worked for a management consulting firm. And I, it was just the most incredible first job. And, and I think about that a lot in terms of how that's guided my career and the experiences that I had. So that we'll talk about that a little bit later, but you know, I was doing socioeconomic analyses and cost benefit analyses and things like that. Very interesting projects. And what it taught me was, you know, you're a consultant. So hard work for sure. And also accountability. I was responsible for producing reports and doing research that, you know, as a kid right out of school, you know, back in the early nineties, um, was just unfathomable to me. So it, it, that was just an incredible first job. But then uh, I did that for three or four years and then kind of hit a crossroads. It's like, okay, where do I want to start to ground my life? Do I want to stay on the West Coast? And there was a few things that drew me to Toronto and I moved to Toronto with really no uh, prospects in play. It was just like, okay, I'm just going to hop in my, uh, I think Nissan Pathfinder at the time and <laughs> drove <laughs> through all my, my worldly possessions in the back seat, and off I went and drove across the country. That's great. And uh, got here and, you know, my brother was here and, you know, we started banning about ideas. What's going to happen? What are we going to do? He, he and I had already talked about getting into business together or do something interesting. So I won't get into all the details, but we, we started a company that, you know, ultimately became the Elevator News Network, which at the time it was that, but um, ultimately became Captivate. Uh, which is still a going concern. I'm no longer involved, obviously, but that was in itself an amazing experience because that was super entrepreneurial. It was a startup, things that you can relate to, David. Um, you know, bootstrap financing, new concepts, really pushing the envelope. You know, talk about hard work. Like that was really hard work, but incredibly gratifying and exhilarating. And and we grew that business from uh, 1994 is when we started, um, you know, the internet it was dial-up internet. So just for perspective of anybody that doesn't know what dial-up internet is, like, like it is, the world has changed a lot. And um, we were piping content into elevators by dial-up internet. And we grew that business across North America, raised a whole bunch of dough. It was just an incredible run. Then the dot bomb crash happened and, you know, our, our financing, we had lots of money, but the prospects for future financing weren't that great. And, and our biggest uh, investor was Goldman Sachs. And they basically said, you got one competitor, merge it up. And so we merged with Captivate out of Boston. And uh, I did that for another couple of years and then left, and, you know, because all that sweat equity hadn't turned into significant personal equity. Um, <laughs> I still had to work. And and so I was, again, at a crossroads going, what's the future look like? And, and my role at ENN had a lot of real estate uh, 
requirements. I, I was the guy kind of selling the product in the real estate marketplace. And one of my clients was Manulife. And Manulife, when I called my clients and said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm, I'm moving on from Captivate at the time. Um, Peter McDonald at Manulife said, well, hey, do you want to come in and talk to me about you know, a role in our organization. And I'm like, uh, okay. I hadn't really thought that far ahead. So I went and talked to Peter and, and, you know, another great life lesson, uh, career lesson, you know, he said, I believe in transferable skills. I believe in competencies more than experience. And he goes, your experience is outside real estate, but I think there's some core competencies that can help our organization. And he took a flyer on me. Mm-hmm. And I accepted the job as a property director for the Toronto region. And that's what got me into property management and the real estate game. And, you know, it took guts for Peter to hire me. And I'm forever grateful for that. Um, but you need those fortunate events and right. put yourself in a position for those fortunate events to happen. And so for Manny Life, I went on to Bentel and Bentel Kennedy which became Quadriel, and now today I'm at Davis and Young. So it, it, since then, it's just been a series of successive um, journeys through the real estate business. But you know, right. it really all started for me on that moment when Peter said, "You know, will you come and join Manual Life?" Really interesting. Well, first of all, you and I—I I guess we—we we first began working together at Manual Life, that's and right. Peter McDonald was very involved in 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 my beginning to work with Manual Life as well. So that's very interesting. We have that in common. And I guess our, our careers are somewhat flipped in that, um, you know, I worked in commercial real estate, uh, you know, while running my marketing communications agency for the first part of my career and are now doing that, that very entrepreneurial tech startup where you chose to do that first and ended up in commercial real estate. So I guess we're sort of topsy-turvy there. Uh, interesting how things turn out. Uh, so why do you think you were uniquely suited to this opportunity? So, you know, interesting you talked about that that. that moment in time, but any unique skills that you think have helped you to become successful? Yeah, you know, I don't think I have any unique skills. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> really like, Peter saw something clearly. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think, honestly, I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded and surround myself with really great people and being able to work for some really great companies. And those things combined inform your perspective and inform your de- your um, your decision making, but also the experiences that I've had along the way. Right, like going from a very like super entrepreneurial environment at a startup through to you know, and this was a, honestly a conscious decision, saying yes at Annual Life because I thought if I can survive in that corporate world coming from such an entrepreneurial world, then ultimately maybe my career finds its way back in the middle and right. with an entrepreneurial element, but utilizing those core competencies that you learn in the corporate world. So, you know, I think back and it was actually very conscious concept. I needed a job too. Who's kidding you? But it was, it was like, if you have a few options, how does this play out in the future? And, and I was trying to think two, two or three steps ahead. So, you know, maybe that's a unique skill. I don't know, right. but uh, you know, I'm not. I'm certainly not the most talented guy or the smartest guy in the room. I try to find the people that are the smartest and surround myself with them. Right. You once shared a story. I'm going to just, uh, di- just take a different uh, uh, track for a moment. But you once shared a story, in particular, how you um, chose to go to Quadrille from Bentall, um, and you had an opportunity to go down two paths. Um, uh, the property management path or the path you chose. I wonder if you could just tell me, share with our listeners uh, a little bit about that story because I think it's pretty uh, interesting. Yeah, that, I'd forgotten that we talked about that. Um, uh, yeah, so when Quadril was set up, um, you know, Remco Dahl, the president at Bentle Kennedy, but ultimately the president at, uh, at Quadril, was talking to me about future opportunities. And, you know, there was a path down the more traditional route of kind of running a region for property management versus, you know, Remco had this idea around the customer experience. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, we don't put enough focus on our customers in this business. We were transaction oriented. We are uh, 
operationally oriented, but at the end of the day, it all boils down to the customer. Where's our focus on the customer? So he laid out this conceptual idea of the the role as a the head of customer experience that I ultimately ended up accepting. Because and the reason I said yes is because I agreed with him philosophically, and I thought, you know, if this doesn't work out, you know, I'll have learned something along the way, but it's, it's starting to take me back down that entrepreneurial path. Right. And, and it gave me an opportunity and a platform to do some things, push the envelope a little bit, you know, stumble a little bit, make some mistakes, but it was the ability to own some ideas and really, really push an agenda that was important to me. So that actually was a very easy decision. Once I weighed the pros and cons of each and I was more true to my own heart, quite frankly, about what was going to excite me about a new job. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, any advice for someone wanting to follow a similar path? I guess may, maybe from entrepreneur to more of the corporate environment or, or just within the commercial real estate industry as a whole. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that there's a few fundamentals that apply to any job, any career, any industry, you know, hard work, um, you got to work. You just, you have to work hard, especially early, not, not especially early from day one. Right. Like, it, 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 you know, it's it pretty never basic. Stops. It never um, stops. I would, I would say, you know, be humble. Um, and humility kind of leads into the next point, which is be a good listener, right? Like, um, if you surround yourself with good people and you're part of good organizations and you listen to what's going on around you, it, it you're picking things up all the time. And that helps inform your, your future direction, things you want to do, things that are important to you and the lessons that you're going to learn and apply. Right. So, so be humble, work hard, be a good listener. Um, and then I think surround yourself with those interesting people. And, and so, you know, I've got teenage kids, late teens, they're starting to, you know, finish up high school and, and head off to university. And, you know, they've actually both got their first summer jobs ever. Um, they've been camp kids, but camp is done, so they can't be counselors anymore. So it's like, you're not sitting around all summer, so go get a job. And they were fortunate enough to get jobs. But in those discussions, I said, you know, you've got to build your story. Your own, what's your own personal narrative? And, and so when you go in and talk to a prospective employer, um, what are you going to talk to them about? You know, you're, you're 17 years old. What, what's your story? And it got them, get some thinking about what have I done? And also what do I want to do? And they, they've got to build that narrative. I think we're all still building our own personal narrative, right? Like when you talk about what led me to where I am today, you know, that's your story. Mm -hmm. And we all have experiences along the way. Try to make those experiences as impactful as possible, I would say. Yep. That, that process never really ends. And I think that the notion of storytelling, the skill of storytelling uh, serves us all very well, particularly uh, in new venture. Um, so what's the biggest challenge you're currently experiencing and how do you think you'll overcome it? Um, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, we're in a pretty unique time. So it, it's, yeah, this, the answer kind of applies realistically to all points in life, but you know, in particular now, you know, there's too many things to do with too little time and too little money. Right. And that, that applies personally and professionally. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, uh, my, my role at AY, um, you know, I've got all kinds of ideas. I've got, you know, the runway and the support that I've got organizationally and where, we want to take the property management group at Avis and Young um, is really exciting. And then I was just two months into this gig when, when COVID hit, you know, I have to say like we haven't had a lot of time to do some of those things that we wanted to get done. And so the challenges are um, keeping focus on those initiatives and where we want to take the business while dealing with the fires that are, Right. burning right now. And, um, you know, the good news is I think not that we're past COVID, but the, uh, 
the fires have dulled a little bit. Like it, it's, we've gotten into routine. I think we all personally have sort of figured it out and what, what makes us comfortable. So I'm seeing even in my own day, starting to pivot back to what I wanted to do in the first place. So it's, you know, that I think that's good news because if I'm feeling that way, I think a whole bunch of other people are probably feeling that way. And, and, you know, life's going to continue to carry on, which is a good thing. Right. You talked about never having enough money, both personally and professionally. Well, today's your lucky day. Uh, I'm going to give you an uh, extra hundred thousand dollars. Now, maybe for you and in, in, in this <laughs> grand scheme of things, that needs to be a hundred million dollars. I'm not sure, but let's start with a hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars of new budget right now. How would you spend it and why? Well, I guess, you know, it's a, if it's a one-time hundred thousand dollars, you know, which is not an insignificant amount of money, but you know, uh, you know what I would do with that money, David? I, I think that, um, and this is probably property management specific, but I'd, I'd try to put that back into the hands and pockets of my team, uh, and reward them for what they've done over the last four months. Um, you know, the, Money doesn't mean anything, but mean mon- money's still important, right? And and you know, um, these people, the the property managers, the unsung heroes of our industry, um, they've been going to work every day while others have been working from home. You know, they're doing their regular day job while helping to develop pandemic plans within their buildings. Mm-hmm. They're managing the commercial rental assistance program while managing tenant arrears and things like that at the same time. Got to communicate more than ever with our clients as well as with our constituents and our customers. You know, these are all net new things that they're doing. And and the team, you know, across the industry, but I'll speak to Avis Young, they've worked incredibly hard over the last four months. I'd love to be able to say, Hey, here's, right. here's some thanks for that monetary thanks. You know, nobody's giving me that hundred thousand dollars. It's not kicking around because things are tight. Things are tight right. all over the place. But, um, you know, that's what I would do because at the end of the day, you got to keep your people happy and you got to say thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so along the way, any resources, mentors, colleagues, books that have really helped you along your journey? Uh, Absolutely. So, um, so from a book, I think my favorite, I'm, I'm a nonfiction guy. So, okay. um, you know, I've, I've read lots of management books and things like that, but there's one book that always stands out to me and that's uh, good to great by Jim Collins. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you haven't, if you haven't read it, read it. Um, yeah. it, it's, there's just so many lessons in there about how to go from good to great. And they're very simple concepts, which is, you know, that speaks to me because I'm a pretty simple guy. And, and so, um, I've, I read that book years ago. I've reread it a couple other times just to refresh and, and re ingrain those concepts. Um, so that would be a book that was pretty impactful for me. Um, you know, I talked about Peter McDonald as a, as a mentor, uh, he was very impactful for me, you know, and, and, you know, outside the fact that he took a flyer on me, I was, I was a couple months into that job and um, I was overwhelmed. I was, you know, working very hard uh, and I had a family of illness and um, mm. my father was ill. I had to go out to Victoria and I was probably going to have to go out a few times and I was pretty stressed out. Oh, and by the way, I was having a, my first baby at the same time. And, uh, and he said, you know what, relax. He goes, this is, it, we're this a big ship. You're not, you're, it's not going to live or die because of you. And there's lots of people to pick up the slack while you're dealing with this stuff. And that, I'll never forget that because I've tried to think the same way in a go forward basis as I manage people and teams and things like that. It, it's, you know, we're a team and right. he instilled that more than ever in me. And then there was another lesson with somebody I worked with, you know, this comes back to decision making, but he says he goes, decision making is very simple, you know, and, and delegation and authority is very simple. He goes, I think about it as being above and below the water line. So your ship, um, you know, if you get hit by a missile above the water line, you can repair the ship. Right. If you get hit 
below the waterline, the ship sinks. So he goes, I will give you as much decision-making authority as you need. Just never make a decision that's below the waterline. Right. And, you know, I, I apply those lessons and, and, you know, I think about that all the time. It's, it's given me the confidence and, you know, empowerment to feel good about making decisions because I think, okay, there's a calculated risk here, but it's always above the waterline. And, and, you know, if you, if it's below, then you talk to people and you get, you move it up the chain. But, um, that, that phrase always sticks out for me as well. Okay. Um, can you share any details about something new you're working on that you think our listeners might find interesting? either in light of current circumstances or as you mentioned earlier, you've got a whole bunch of new initiatives that you're bringing to this new opportunity, this new business. Um, yeah. I, you know, uh, there's a lot of things in the property management space. You know, the, you're working on some stuff around tenant experience applications and, and you know, there's, there's all kinds of prop tech out there. Um, and when I talked earlier about, kind of the runway and what we want to do. Those are all things that we want to start going down the path on uh, and are exploring. It doesn't happen as fast as one because there's <laughs> too, too many things to do with too little time and too little money. But right. uh, that is all percolating along the road while we do all kinds of other things that are just stabilizing the business and growing the business. And so, you know, my role is a new role at Davis & Young. We didn't have this national... Um, leadership in the past. So I'm working very hard at, you know, standardizing processes, establishing operating protocols, the consistency of service across the country to all our clients, um, stitching the various business lines together and expanding our sustainability practices and expanding our innovation, expanding our building operations to really focus and, and those have those become centers of excellence and things that we can stand up against the best companies in the business and, and say, you know, we're really good at this and we will take care of our customers and our clients through all these various um, disciplines. So there's lots to do on all that sort of stuff, but that's, that's really what we're working on. So I, I, it's not that sexy necessarily, but it's, it's pretty foundational and, and it moves us down the path to being able to do more and more interesting things. Right. So it's taking, you know, it's, it's a vision to take the company to a, a whole new level. And, um, uh, you know, again, that speaks, I guess, to your to your entrepreneurial. You talked earlier about sort of going to how this corporate world prepared you. But it sounds like in this new role, you're you have the opportunity to be both corporate, but also entrepreneurial once again. Yeah, a- absolutely. So, it, you know, I, I think about that and, and you know, yeah, this is it's part of what appealed to me about Avis Young. Like the culture is incredible uh, at this organization, the people and the leadership from Mark Rose as CEO down, um, it's a very caring organization. It, things that are really important to me on a on a personal kind of values perspective. And we get the latitude and runway to, to make it our own at the same time and put our own stamp on it. So it, it's a it's a pretty neat opportunity. And you know, I'm, what am I? I'm six months into it and uh, and it's been it's been fun, despite COVID. Right. <laughs> Um, okay, so if, if you could have one superpower, uh, what do you think that would be and why? Um, I, I would like to be able to, I'm not sure if this is the right word, uh, teleport or transport myself, teleport myself, okay, right? Sure. So just go from one place to another. A little Star uh, Trek-like? Yeah, exactly. Because, and the reason for that, so I love being around people. I love... Uh, communicating with my team, you know, Zoom has been fantastic, but I can't wait to get back to the office and interact with people face to face. You know that that human connection, and with a national role, you know, obviously I haven't been any other offices. I haven't seen anybody. You know, our Toronto office is now starting to softly open, and so I'm having a few personal meetings. But I'd love to be able to avoid the airports now more than ever. Right. And just get to Vancouver. I'd like to be in Vancouver in an hour, in half an hour, as soon as we're done this call. And and so that's unfortunately not the reality. But if I had a superpower, I'd be able to just go anywhere at any time so that I could build those connections and, and be a part of the, the day-to-day life of the teams across the country. Right. Well, they're, they're saying that COVID has... 
uh, is not necessarily bringing about new phenomenons, but it's certainly accelerating the pace of change and, and things that were already in play, you know, making them, you know, happen or be needed that much faster. And I think uh, if there was some type of teleportation, you know, in, in, the, in the far distant future, I think we'd all love it to see that now. Absolutely. Um, and I, like you, and certainly speaking for my team, we can't wait to get back to the workplace as well. Um, certainly, we've, we've made this work, um, and technologies like Zoom have helped us to do that. Um, but uh, it's, it's not, in our opinion, it's not sustainable. And, and the need to be together, to, to collaborate, to have those, op- those um, unexpected opportunities of creativity and, and collaboration, uh, and, and just the notion of spontaneity in terms of being able to turn to someone and say, I just thought of something, what do you think? Um, it, it's nearly impossible uh, to do that under the current circumstances. So, well, I'd also, I'd also to that, I totally agree with you. And, and you know, the other thing, uh, first of all, I, by no means do I think that the, the office is dead. They, you know, I think there will be more flexibility in the future. I think, I think COVID has taught us this social experiment that we, we, you can make work from home possible. Mm-hmm. It works. We can trust people to carry on and right. complete their jobs, even if they're not in the office. But the value of the office is those collision, spontaneity, conversations, and culture. And and you can't build a culture on Zoom, right? And so you have to be part of the office. You have to be part of this organism that is moving and shaping and, and molding itself every day. Um, and that just doesn't happen when you have people in disparate disparate parts of the city right. communicating like we are right now. Like it, it's, you can, you can communicate, but it's not the same. And, and the culture definitely doesn't come out. And you know, if you're, if you're trying to build a long-term sustainable company, you have the culture is everything. And um, that's why we need to get back to the office. Right, you drew a, a, a correlation between the culture that you create and then the trust that people actually, when they are working independently, uh, will follow through. And I think you're absolutely right. I think they're directly connected. Um, I think it's the, it's all that cultural cultural that was built up prior to COVID that has allowed for that that trust to actually be given, and then for actually people without question to perform at a very high level, um, right. even under these circumstances. Um, so, what are you curious about right now? Anything you're thinking about differently? Uh, in light of the current circumstances, obviously including COVID um, or just the general nature of commercial real estate, but uh, what sort of got your curiosity at the moment? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, on, uh, from a real estate front, uh, you know, we talked about the return to auto. Like the, other, the other asset classes are, you know, industrials rock solid, strong as ever. Um, multifamily is as strong as ever. Retail, I think... <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about retail. Like, I, I think there will be winners and losers in retail for sure. Um, and office, I think, I think will be unaffected. I, I really do. I, I think that it will continue to be where people want to work. And so office is going to be fine. I think within the office environment, you know, there's a, I would say that there's probably some push and pull and or, um, evolution around sustainability, you know, that some of the practices that we're implementing today are directly counterintuitive to trying to be sustainable, right? Like more uh, dense filters that require you to push more air and use more energy, um, fresh air balances and things like that. They, those are, those don't necessarily right. apply to sustainability. Um, masks and disposable gloves and things like that. I mean, all that, all that sort of stuff is counter to what the industry's been trying to do for a long time. I think I'm, I'm curious as to where that falls out. Uh, I think that there's going to be an increasing trend around wellness. You know, there's, Mm -hmm. there's certifications, the well certification or fit well, other things, um, do, does sustainability morph into wellness and, and personal wellness compared to what the way we were before, um, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, you go higher level and talk about politics and things like that. You know, I, I guess the, the one thing I would, 
I guess I'd be most curious about would be, we talk about kind of paradigm shifts or, you know, it's going to be different this time, or this is going to systemically change the way we do X. I'm curious as to whether that is in fact the case, because, because I think as human beings, we revert to the mean. Right. And when this is over, whenever that is, call it, call it a year from now. And there's a vaccine and everything. I think we'll be, I think we'll be packing bars. I think we'll be carrying on. I think we'll be working as hard. Maybe some of that work-life balance that we talked about, even just in the last 20 minutes, that might disappear. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm curious about that because I, I, I do, I'm a little skeptical. I think we'll learn small lessons and continue to evolve, but I don't think there's um, exponential change that's going to come right. out of this societally. I think just on that last point, I'd love to, you know, re reconvene either a year or two years from now and just address that last question or that last point, because I think you're right. We generally do return to the old, the old ways. And um, I, I, my, I suspect there will be more change uh, than we've seen in the past that will come out of this. Um, but you're right. We, we tend to sort of go back to uh, an old new normal. So all to be determined. And that's something we can certainly circle back on. Um, so to that end, is there anything you, you wish you had known when you first started out? Um, no, I think in, on, so, well, uh, maybe, uh, so <laughs> I think one of the greatest things that you have early in your career is naivety. And so when we were starting the Elevator News Network, I was completely naive to the limitations and how hard it would be to introduce a new product, right? So you're experiencing this, right? Like yeah. the, 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 the tenant experience app and how do you push that startup concept? And, you know, I was naive enough to not be afraid. And so, you know, I guess dive right in, have, have conviction around what you're doing and it'll probably work out, right? Like it's, it comes back to that hard work. You gotta be smart about things, but if you work hard and have strong conviction, you can you can take things in the direction that you want and ultimately, you know, you'll probably be successful. And success doesn't mean monetary expense, so, or uh, success. Success can be experiential success that informs your future. I didn't make any money out of my Elevator News Network experience. <laughs> Right. But I gained a heck of a lot of experience that has helped me continue down the path of my career. And, it, and that's, that's perfect. That's okay. It, it's not about money. It's about, it's about where you, where you end up. Right. Well, I'm about three or four years now into my new venture and I certainly did not know uh, everything uh, then that I know now. Um, but I'll be honest, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, right. And you're right. It is an incredible amount of hard work. Um, and I think that, you know, anything that you really believe in, uh, in life does require that level of hard work. Nothing is ever easy. Um, and, uh, um, it is all about the journey and you've certainly had an interesting one, not only, uh, geographically from Victoria to Toronto and where that has led you, but also from, from entrepreneur to the corporate world and now back into still in the corporate setting, but with an entrepreneurial flair. Um, so I really want to thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. Um, really appreciated uh, the conversation. Of course, uh, you and I go way back, but it's always nice to, to learn more about you, which I have. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation at a later date. That sounds great, David. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Take care. All the best. You too. Bye now. I want to thank Neil LaSure for joining us on today's podcast and for sharing his journey from his early beginnings as an entrepreneur to now leading the team at Avis & Young. Great learning for all our listeners and an opportunity to gain insights into what it takes to be an effective leader. Please be sure to tune in again for future discussions with leading professionals and industry experts who all have something to say about experience in the built world and the impact the technology is having on the largest asset class in the world, commercial real estate. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on a future episode, please reach out to me directly at david at hiloapp.com. And until our next episode, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work or live. Thank you.